As Brian shared before, the American dream, it's increasingly out of reach for many people. And many of those being left behind are veterans. Seemingly endless wars are responsible for over a million life-changing disabilities. And those military families are suffering. This is a moral, fiscal, constitutional, and security problem. And it's actually much worse than people realize. Consider the war in Afghanistan, America's longest war. Here's some commentary about this 18-year conflict. If we're doing such a great job, why does it feel like we're losing? We didn't have the foggiest notion of what we were undertaking. I have no visibility into who the bad guys are. Help. Any guess who these quotes are from? They're private correspondences from a three-star army general, another three-star army general, and a United States Secretary of Defense. The Washington Post published these quotes as part of a larger report dubbed the Afghanistan Papers. It includes thousands of official government documents that show that senior US officials consistently told the American public that they were making progress, when in reality, they were not. And they knew it. This was a failure of leadership and it cost American lives. This happened under Republican and Democrat administrations alike, and it confirms what so many Afghanistan veterans, like myself, have long known. There's no military solution to be had there. The fact that two-thirds of Afghanistan veterans say this war isn't worth fighting, it tells you all you need to know about its futility. And it's not just Afghanistan. Since 9-11, American troops have been deployed to over a dozen combat zones around the world, including Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Somalia, Libya, and more. The United States has 800 bases abroad, establishing a police presence all the way around the world. This isn't just a policy issue, though. This is a moral issue. In Afghanistan and Iraq alone, 14,700 American men and women in uniform and contractors have been killed. One million disabled. Suffering from things like PTSD, the suicide rate for veterans is twice the national average. It's a fiscal issue. Taxpayers have spent $6 trillion in Afghanistan and Iraq. That's more than the cost of military operations in World Wars I and II combined. It's a constitutional issue. Presidents of both parties have exploited congressional authorizations for Afghanistan and Iraq to justify military operations around the world. And Congress does nothing. And it's a security issue. Since 9-11, global terrorism has gotten worse. And when we keep our troops in countries for decades at a time, it puts them in harm's way. And it puts our country in no-win situations, which is what we're seeing play out in the conflict with Iran today. There's gotta be a better way. And at Concerned Veterans for America, that's what we're seeking. Our vision, America must have a strong military that can overwhelm a foreign enemy, while also restraining military action to what it can realistically achieve. And we must do more to advance American interests through diplomacy and by leveraging our economy through trade. Many agree with that vision, especially when it comes to ending endless wars in the Middle East. 
That includes previous and current presidents. The previous and the current president. Both of them had the same instincts on this. President Obama said, I do not believe America's interests are served by endless wars. And President Trump, great nations do not fight endless wars. Unfortunately, both presidents were confronted by a foreign policy establishment that disagrees. The scholars offering guidance, the businesses seeking military contracts, and the pundits shaping public opinion. For the past 30 years, those who view military action as the best option have had an outsized influence on nearly every foreign policy decision. And they often label anyone who disagrees with them isolationists. It ought to be clear by now that's not what anyone here is proposing. That's why this group really began to ramp up our investments in foreign policy five years ago. And that includes many of you who stepped up your commitment to show a better way in foreign policy and to give voice to those who support it. And it starts by investing in groups like these. Some of the nation's top scholars and organizations that focus on foreign policy and that advise presidents of both parties. They're challenging the status quo and they're bringing a fresh perspective to decades old ways of thinking. And while they're showing a better way in universities and up on Capitol Hill, Concerned Veterans for America is doing the same thing in communities across the country. Because to transform how our country engages in foreign policy, it's going to take a movement, a movement of millions of people. And that's beginning to emerge as we identify where people's true beliefs aren't being represented, as we show that there is a better way, and as we unite a diversity of voices. It starts by giving voice to those that aren't represented. That's the voice of veterans. Two out of three veterans want to end the war in Afghanistan. That's why bringing our troops home from Afghanistan is our first milestone. The president wants to do it. Our veterans want to do it. The American people want to do it. So let's get it done. That's why last week we launched a major new campaign. It's called End Endless Wars. It's designed to engage people who are feeling the brunt of America's endless wars in Afghanistan and across the Middle East, and to show that there's a better way. States like Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. Military families there have experienced devastating casualty rates from these wars. And this campaign is going to give them a voice. Just last week, as part of End Endless Wars, we launched a seven-figure communications and grassroots effort. It features the voices of Afghanistan veterans who want to bring our troops home. One way people can get involved is by writing letters to their congressperson. And already, in one week since we launched, over 50 thousand letters have been sent to our leaders in Washington. 50,000. That is amazing. Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. These are also battleground states in 2020. And you better believe candidates from both parties are going to listen to what these families have to say. It's a way to elevate their voice onto a national stage. But we can't end these endless wars alone. We've partnered with a coalition that agrees on this issue, including some non-traditional allies. Groups like Vote Vets. It's an organization that identifies in the progressive left and who we've actually gone head to head with on other issues. In fact, they spearheaded the opposition to the historic reforms at the Department of Veterans Affairs that we led to give veterans the health care choice they deserve. Take a look at this video 
featuring my colleague at Concerned Veterans for America, Dan Caldwell, and the head of Vote Vets, John Soltz. My name is John Soltz, Chairman, VoteVets.org. My name is Dan Caldwell, Senior Advisor to Concerned Veterans for America. I viewed Vote Vets as, you know, frankly, our arch nemesis. If we were taking a position, Vote Vets would take the opposite position, I think, vice versa. Concerned Veterans was a worthy opposition. We just don't agree policy-wise with their vision on many issues. One of our biggest defeats we talk about is we got our butts kicked on the VA, okay? We got our butts kicked on the VA, courtesy of these guys. Despite my trash talking over the years about Vote Vets, we do have a common bond through military service. A partnership between us uh, will enable us ultimately to advance some good shared goals. There is pretty substantial agreement within the veteran community that we need to pursue a more restrained foreign policy. The last five years, Concerned Veterans for America has been doing an event called Vets on the Hill, where we fly in our staff and sometimes our volunteers to go and lobby on Capitol Hill for our legislative agenda. And for the first time ever, we're partnering with another group, and that group is Vote Vets. This coalition is backed by hundreds and hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of grassroots activists on both sides of the aisle. It's our job as activists to identify where Congress is negligent and begin to establish paths forward and create political repercussions for people that don't want to do their job. We're putting muscle behind this fight and we're leveraging our grassroots armies to advance these shared goals we have around foreign policy. I love that. Uh, John said it, not me, to admit that we kicked his butt on camera. But, but he's become a heck of a partner in this. And look at, what it's, look at what it's doing. Uniting a diversity of voices, it's giving more people the courage to speak up and take action for what they believe. People from all walks of life are starting together and show that there's a better way. You only saw a fraction of it. Veterans, military families, scholars, business leaders, grassroots activists, policymakers. The movement to transform our foreign policy is emerging. And to illustrate how this unites people from different perspectives and backgrounds, we've invited two leaders to share their thoughts on this issue. Former Senator Jim Webb is here. Senator Webb served as a lieutenant in the United States Marine Corps during Vietnam. He was awarded the Navy Cross for heroism, two Purple Hearts, a Silver Star, and two Bronze Stars. He served as Secretary of the Navy under President Reagan and then later as a Democrat U.S. Senator from Virginia. Senator, how important is it that we unite people on this issue to overcome the thinking that's gotten us into this situation? Well, thank you for that, and uh, I, I'm happy to be able to come here and speak for just two or three minutes, as I was asked. I'm very clear, I, I'm not a speaker. I'm uh, three steps down from being one of your speakers today. <laughs> but, uh, and excuse me for putting my back to you, Nate, as I answer your question. Uh, but I think when you look at where we are in foreign policy today, even those of us who, like myself, grew up in the military, served in combat, my son served as a, a Marine rifleman in Iraq, have to say that the foreign policy apparatus in this country is now broken, and it needs to be fixed, and it needs to be fixed with po positive leadership. Um, I'll take that. <laughs> um, if uh, you look at any of the programs that so many people in this room have done. There's so many leaders in this room, business leaders, uh, leaders in other areas of thought and action. The first thing you do is you put together your goals and your missions, and you figure out where you're going. You communicate them to your people. It's basic common sense. Uh, in the Marine Corps, no matter how chaotic combat got, we always could fall back on what we called SMEAC, 
five paragraphs which you could, where you could communicate to your people what you needed to do. What's the situation? What's the mission? How do you execute it? What's the admin? What's the command and control? Let's get it done. This is the bottom line. We had that for many years in this country, and I think the end of the Cold War and then the 9-11 has reached the point where there really is no articulated foreign policy strategy that the average American leader can sit down and say, this is what we're doing, this is where we want to go. The last doctrine that I believe worked for us in, this, in uh, foreign policy was the Nixon Doctrine coming out of the Vietnam War, which clearly articulated the circumstances under which we would put our troops into areas where we would help our allies, uh, where, we, where we would provide uh, assistance without putting our own troops on the ground. This has really run aground in the Afghanistan and the Middle East area since 9-11. I think there were a lot of good intentions and, and a desire to eliminate international terrorism but any logical proposition can be carried to a ridiculous extreme. I was in Afghanistan as a journalist before I ran for the Senate in the 2004, which is an interesting time period. And Nate, I want, I want to thank Nate for the rundown he gave on the situation there now. In 2004, it was a transitional year. There were about 10,000 Americans on the ground in 2004. Um, they were transitioning slowly uh, with the mission creep that we've seen so often in that part of the world from maneuver warfare going out after terrorist entities into this notion that we can nation build in a country that's resisted outside nation building for the last 2,000 years or so. Uh, we followed this same pattern in other areas, uh, including Iraq. I warned about the Iraq uh, situation five months before the invasion of Iraq saying, if we do this, it will be one of the great strategic blunders. We will empower Iran and we also will empower China. It was just so clear before we went into Iraq. So what do we need? How do we get people to come together on the issues of foreign policy? We do it with leadership. We do it with asking leadership to come up with a doctrine that people can understand and to implement it. The um, old saying that you don't take out a hornet's nest by sitting on it, to me, summarizes the situation in the Middle East today. And we're having a, a breakout session tomorrow on foreign policy. I look forward to seeing uh, any of you who would like to come to that. We can speak about this in more detail. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Webb. Uh, thank you for your service to our country and for being a good partner on this. We've also asked Senator Mike Lee to share his thoughts with us. But like the rest of the Senate, he is stuck in Washington, D.C. this weekend, could not be here with us. But he wanted to share this video message with you. U.S. military personnel have now been in Afghanistan for nearly two decades. We've remained behind many years after the enemy we were originally deployed to combat has been defeated. And it's time for us to have an open, honest, robust debate in Washington about what our foreign policy goals are, specifically in Afghanistan. It's important for us to remember that with great power comes great responsibility. The United States of America has developed the strongest military force the world has ever known. In order for us to maintain that edge, We've got to make sure that we use this power wisely and effectively. And we've got to make sure that groups like Concerned Veterans for America continue to have a seat at the table. With your continued involvement, participation, friendship, and support, we can change American foreign policy for the better. Big thanks to Senator Lee. He has been a terrific partner on this issue for many years. Ending endless wars is not an issue of left and right. It's an issue of right and wrong. And it will bring enormous benefits to our country. Moral, fiscal, constitutional, and security. And I can tell you there is a great urgency to act. 
Every day counts. Let me give you an example. 34 days ago, my friend was killed in Afghanistan. I trained with him, I deployed with him, I had the honor to fight next to him. And his body came home to his family on Christmas Day. You see, all of us have the opportunity to change this. To ensure that no more Americans have to pay the ultimate sacrifice in an unending war that due to its very nature can never be won. This group is the only group with the capabilities to do it. So thank you for Thank you for having the courage that it's going to take. Together, we are showing that there is a better way. And our country is going to be stronger for it. Thank you.